<laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much uh, for, for attending uh, for me first time uh, and really excited uh, to, to meet you all. Uh, so before uh, getting into the point and introducing our speakers today, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Ana Jimenez. Uh, I'm currently working in a project called Tudor Group. It's an OSPO community of practitioners uh, developing best practices on open source management and operations within organizations. Um, and because of that, I've, I've get the honor to uh, get a lot of experience in OSPOS. Also, in my background, I came from a company called Viteria, a focus on analytics field. And there, more from the data science field, I got the, the honor also to get a lot of experience in, in working with open source program office metrics in terms of uh, measuring community health, uh, security checks, and so on. Uh, so I think uh, before starting with with the, with the discussion today that uh, we will also love to hear your, your feedback, your questions uh, during this one hour session. Uh, let's start with our speakers. Uh, Mirko, would you like to, to get to start and introduce yourself? Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm Mirko Böhm, I'm with the Linux Foundation Europe. Um, my background is as an open source contributor for a long time and in economics and uh, recently a lot in Brussels talking to the European Commission and others about the regulation that is coming up and affecting our communities and I think that's what we're going to talk about today. So glad, glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, my name is Floor. I'm based in the Netherlands. I work for Ivan, which is a data and AI platform. Uh, that means that we have a lot of services underpinning our uh, platform, like Postgres, Cassandra, um, MySQL, ClickHouse, uh, you name it. Uh, and so for us, this regulation is uh, kind of interesting. What kind of role do we uh, take here? I think my role on this panel is also that I always ask a lot of questions. I don't know if I, if I have all of the answers, but maybe we'll get to those uh, over the course of this panel. And hi everyone, my name is Natalie Vlatko, I'm based in Berlin, Germany, and I work for Cisco as part of the OSPO. Um, our OSPO is global, we span across, uh, in terms of our staff, Europe and the US, um, but uh, you know, the, the EU regulations are also very uh, pertinent and important for us, given how much of a footprint Cisco has in the EU, um, and specifically around OSPOs in terms of how we uh, corral a, a company of 80,000 plus people who are all open source possible contributors or, or maintainers, um, and how we actually go about working with them in terms of security and policy compliance as well. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I'm going to uh, ask if someone... Okay, awesome. Yeah, because uh, before I uh, start discussing, there are a lot of regulations going on, but uh, in today's panel, I think everyone's agreed that we're going to focus on this too, that is uh, really um, a hot topic, uh, specifically the crowd regulation. So for those who are unaware, it's a, a framework uh, put by the European Commission uh, to that presents a set of requirements in terms of cyber resiliency uh, when uh, there is a digital product uh, to be manufactured. Uh, so if you're involved in EU, if this is something that, uh, and, and you're dealing with software and you're uh, manufacturing software, this is something that for sure it's um, impacting. And there's also the uh, recent AI Act. So it's also a legal, a legislative framework uh, on, uh, put it also in, in Europe, in um, EU, uh, in terms of how to use uh, artificial intelligence. So saying this also, um, we're going to get a, a few questions to our speakers, but I want you also to check this slide. So you can scan your code. Uh, we want this to be interactive and dynamic. So we're going to go through a set of questions, but we also want you to be able to ask your own to the speakers. So please uh, use this QR. I will be checking, and by the at, at the end of the presentation on the panel discussions, uh, I will be I will do my best to to share those to the speakers so they can answer them. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to leave that uh, so you have time to, to check. Um, okay, so I think the first question, and this goes more for the CRA, 
and because I keep hearing all, all the time is in the crowd there is this distinction between manufacturers and open source stewards. So um, my question goes more for, uh, for you, Mirko, like what is the difference and what to expect? Okay, so I think this is something that you all really want to hear. Um, so until now, um, open source has been hugely successful, but I think we've mostly considered ourselves a bit of a, like an, uh, a community that goes uh, gets along well and is uh, slightly apolitical, like we're flying under the radar for regulation, and um, we've been mostly untouched by it. This time is over. <laughs> um, yes, it is, um, because with the Cyber Resilience Act, um, for the first time in EU law, uh, open source organizations have their own legal responsibility or, or role in the law separate from manufacturers. Um, and, and this is new. This is new in EU law. We have never had it before. And uh, clearly, EU law is written in a way that all businesses, be they in the US, need to follow it if they want to do business in Europe. So this is practically a global um, what are these two roles? Manufacturers are relatively clear. If you make a product and you bring it into the market and it has bits and bytes in it, it's a digital product, um, then it's covered by the Cyber Resilience Act and you need to follow basic cyber resilience requirements. Everybody can agree to that, very simple. Um, pure vulnerabilities, lifetime support, and um, more information for consumers. So I think everybody is probably happy with these uh, requirements. Um, if you are an open source community, and you feel responsible to make regular releases of critical products, you're an open source software steward. And you're clearly separate from manufacturers, you have a different set of responsibilities, for example, um, in, in case of vulnerabilities, to work with authorities to disclose information. Uh, it's what, usually we disclose that all information anyway, so that's not really a big deal. Um, but yeah, so basically there are two roles in the future. Manufacturers, not much has changed, and then um, Organized open source communities, uh, charities, non-profit organizations, the larger foundations, um, they're treated as open source software stewards, um, and, and they don't have the responsibilities that manufacturers have to bring products into the market, but they have a, a different set of responsibilities like facilitating documentation of what, comp what software is in, um, uh, what components are in your software, what vulnerabilities are known, etc. So yeah, so for the first time, we have a, a separate economic operator role in EU law for open source software stewards. And my next question uh, is more from the organizational side. So, uh, Flor and Natalie, uh, when dealing uh, with, with specifically, for instance, with the CRA or with the AA Act, who takes the responsibility? Um, is it the OSPO? Is it the security team? Um, great question. It's both in my opinion, uh, and also in Cisco's opinion, in that um, at Cisco, we in the OSPO are taking on the responsibility to try and corral and um, help organize and administer as many of our projects and maintainers internally as possible to make things like uh, reporting in with your hopefully robust security policy for your, for your open source project into our security teams as well. That's something that's a partnership, it goes hand in hand, and it's also something that we are relying on a lot of the open source stewards and foundations also in terms of a lot of the work that they're doing, like the OpenSSF, to help us out with that as well. Um, and when I say help us out, usually it's us asking them a lot of questions and then showing us the documentation we've read a lot of times but maybe missed a certain thing or, some, or, or something like that. Um, and, and it really is a, a both partnership. At the same time, it's also something where um, hum, uh, you know, dealing with humans can sometimes be hard, and so often we are trying to uh, take the process in with as much uh, um, kind of uh, empathy and understanding as possible, but also really underpinning the fact that you know this is a regulation that we must follow, and this is something that um, it might be painful at first, but it's something that everyone has to do. Um, and so we're willing to also help out and 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 take our maintainers and our projects. Um, with us each step of that way, and that's really important that we're working in tandem with them. Yeah, so I think it's both uh, OSPO and security, and then also it starts with legal. Uh, so that, that discussion needs to take place first to really understand the letter of the law. Um, and then I think with any other regulation that was the case too, like GDPR, it's also discussing with your community, like 
communications team, community team? How do you uh, even discuss this with your, your larger community as well? Um, so, you know, cross-department uh, effort, uh, which also makes it very difficult because when everyone is responsible in a way, then no one's responsible. So who's leading that effort uh, is something that will be a topic of discussion for a lot of co uh, corporations and companies right now. Um, and do you think that uh, the role of that foundations plays uh, and the relationship with the communities or uh, organizations are changing with these regulations? And then my, my other question will be like, what, does, what, what, what is the role of foundations that plays here? It's a question for, for everyone who would like to answer. <laughs> um, yes, yes, I think, um, I think it firstly, um, uh, in terms of the changing role, it just um, underpins how important it is to keep supporting those foundations to do that work. Um, uh, and it's something that, uh, that support doesn't only have to be monetary, right? It's, it's something where uh, foundations are on, uh, are, and foundations like the OSI, for example, as well, the Open Source Initiative as well, are constantly looking for um, input and advice and information from us, the community, us as manufacturers and companies. They're looking for our help and our guidance and our input as well. Sometimes that input is also actually my opinion differs from yours and let's have a discussion about it. Um, but that support is something that is, in my opinion, with this change, um, is, is more important than ever. And so our involvement should be even more too on the company manufacturer side. Yeah, I think you'll see a lot of companies attach themselves to the foundation a lot more, uh, which and the foundations that are appropriate for their stack, I guess, which could be really good for some smaller foundations as well uh, to gain more membership. Because I mean, I think some some foundations like Linux Foundation doesn't necessarily need a whole lot more money than they're already getting. Um, I see you laughing because you had a Fosbeck stage talk about uh, you know money flowing to the foundations, but maybe some smaller foundations would really benefit. From from that new user base as well. So, um, is it on? Yes. Um, one thing that is really going to change um, is the understanding that manufacturers have about how they work with the open source communities, because the law makes it a bit more clear than it was before. You may have read this article, open source maintainers owe you nothing, I hope, and I think the European Commission has read it too. And they, they've written the law in a way that they say, um, manufacturers have to fix soft, uh, security vulnerabilities for the life, uh, lifetime of the product, which is at least five years. So there will be no more phones that you buy that stop receiving security updates after a year. It will be five years at least. And they put that up, uh, uh, responsibility clearly on the manufacturers to say, if you bring it into the market, you will have to maintain it, and you have to disclose, you have to ship security fixes for free um, uh, for the lifetime, uh, lifetime of the product. And, and they said, and for the upstream communities, they may work with you vo uh, voluntarily, but they owe you nothing. That's not like, it doesn't say it, they owe you nothing, but that's how the law is written. So there is no obligation in the upstream communities to do anything for the manufacturers. This clearly puts the owners on the manufacturers to work with them. And in discussions we had with the European Commission, they made it very clear that that was their intention. They read all the articles about uh, issues with the sustainability of our development model, with uh, free riding and consuming without contributing. And they said, wait a minute, if we make it more explicit that there's a responsibility to maintain the software if you ship products, then manufacturers should be smart enough to figure out that it's easier to, to do this collaboratively and not all by themselves, which means do it upstream. And uh, so, yes, the relationship will totally change, I hope, and for the better. Um, and I think the task that we have ahead of, for all of us is to shape it, to, to grab this, this opportunity and say, we build this relationship with the, uh, the manufacturers that are using our software um, so that they can engage with us. I think also um, the importance of foundations um, in the forming of the Cyber Resilience Act was also super important, given that the first version of this written was not so great. Um, and it was really coming from foundations and from uh, a lot of different uh, high-level project maintainers and members who were engaging EU policymakers to actually improve the first version of, of, of the writing of that act. It was very, very important. It would have been almost kind of diabolical for, for open source projects if that first if that first draft went through. So that that to me already under underlines how important that collaborative approach 
um, and we talk about it upstream in terms of even getting up into policymakers too. And, and as an OSPO, we're not going to just you know, go to Brussels and knock on someone's door. But what we are going to do is we're going to use our um, collaborative work with foundations to actually help push those conversations. And I think that's something that's, uh, that's, that's super important as part of the foundation's role in a lot of this work. I love this concept of uh, foundations being the voice of a lot of different uh, uh, contributors, companies, uh, non-profit organizations coming together to engage with policymakers. I, I, I really love that. Um, so I'm going to, so we, we keep having questions. I think it's better to, to start answers, uh, at least some of those. I see even like people are voting. So I'm going to go for the most voted ones. So the first one uh, that has a lot of votes really is what aspects of the Cyber Resiliency Act will have prevented the log for cell issue, for instance. Do, do you think it, it will have been prevented that? At <laughs> well, preventing maybe not necessarily, but uh, the response to it uh, maybe, yes. Mm. So, so we can ask what, what does the Cyber Resilience Act change? Uh, it changes two things. It makes manufacturers responsible to ship, uh, ship security fixes. Um, and it increases transparency. So, I mean, we all know security issues will always happen. There, there are diff like bugs in projects. Uh, these bugs can be exploited, and that makes it a security issue. We will not be able to prevent this ever from occurring. So the real question is, what happens if we identify such an issue? How diligently are we looking for them? And this is putting more pressure on the manufacturers to fix their products, makes adds more effort to that diligence. And then how transparent are we when something is found? How agile are we in rolling out those security fixes to products? Like what's the time between I fix this mm -hmm. and it ends up in the last product that has the software uh, included? And until now, this time is forever, basically. We all know that. Um, so I'm not sure if it would have prevented such an issue. But if you consider just the change in, we know that today there are still Log4j affected devices out in the field. I think at least 30%, that was the last number that I heard, are not fixed today. Um, and if, that's, if that can be improved, that's a massive change. So we can maybe cannot prevent it from happening, but we can make the response much stronger. I, I also want to recall, so for instance, uh, more recent happened the YXIT library incident. It was more like a social attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like um, I, I talked with a lot of hospitals when, when that happened, and everyone was agreeing, like, I mean, we cannot change, like, security incidents are going to happen, but we, we, the resiliency on what you Merkel mentioned is, is key. So it's, it's not the same the damage that can cause if it's unknown or not seen for months or weeks rather than, uh, okay, I just noticed in, in just one day or 24 hours, I think what it would happen in, in that. Yeah, I think another thing that this will help push um, as much as we as a community are constantly, you know, I myself also an open source maintainer and we need more of us. We need more maintainers um, on more projects as much as possible. And so this is going to push the need on the manufacturer slash company to actually invest more in maintainers. That's something that's going to be super important where it, there was always a need and there still is, but now that there's law, <laughs> that need is a little bit more pronoun pronounced and, and, and said in a way and in a, um, and in a format that, let's say, a lot of bigger companies might be more willing to actually undertake and understand. So I think on the maintainer front, um, funding maintainers more by, hey, we rely on X project for our large you know, products, how about we hire more people or train more people to actually help um, maintain this open source project and contribute upstream. And then that way, if we're contributing more upstream, we're actually protecting ourselves more from it with this law as opposed to, you know, fighting against it. Yeah. Um, so to add to that, for I think Ivan's OSPO had been considered in the beginning uh, quite a, a different type of OSPO where we paid people to work on uh, upstream projects full time. Uh, that will become a lot more prevalent, I would agree. If I may add one addition. Um, there's always a question what happens if I contribute to an open source project as part of my job? Um, because you're, you're contributing code to 
another entity. Um, and uh, in, in the Cyber Resilience Act, it makes it very clear that contributing to, some, to a project that is under somebody else's responsibility is not covered by the law. And you have to like, think about this a bit, because it's really smart. It means that he can work upstream, and by, by submitting patches upstream and the upstream project accepting them, you are not responsible under the law. So even if you work at the manufacturer, um, this is the, the easy way out. Like you have to maintain, you don't want to be responsible for the projects, for the, for the contributions, so you work upstream first. And this is what we've been telling the industry for the last two, two decades. And um, now there's an active encouragement to say, work this way. And then get the software from upstream and integrate into your product and everything is rather clear. And um, yeah, so it's made explicit and I, I think we should embrace it. Actually, that is really good to, to one of the questions uh, that uh, some of, of you ask, like, what are the responsibilities as an independent contributor in Europe regarding bugs caused by my work? I think, like, well, if, if it's an upstream contribution, that applies. Um, but any uh, other thing that should be, in, like, uh, aware of it if, if you are an independent contributor? contributing to an open source project. I think the key, real question is, are you just a contributor or are you responsible for the project? If, you, if it's your project, you're the only contributor, then you're also responsible for the project. Now, you're not yet a steward, because stewards are supposed to be organizations, and this is like a gray area that the Cyber Resilience Act doesn't regulate. So your, your hobby project that you maintain all by yourself, uh, with no organization around, uh, is under the radar. Um, if you're a small community and you are, I don't know, you've incorporated a nonprofit organization, then you're a steward read the law, because you have different responsibilities <laughs> under that. Um, and uh, another question, uh, and maybe not just focusing on the crowd, but also uh, what is coming now uh, with the AI, uh, AI Act. Uh, wh what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, for open source projects uh, with these regulations? With the AI Act or with the... With, with both. Um, I, I'm just curious because I, I know like the with the AI Act there is new things coming in. Uh, there is like even like an AI definition that the OSI is putting together. So there is a lot of uh, uncertainty. So. Yeah, so I think the AI Act is a really interesting one because it needs to be, uh, you know, AI Act says that uh, AI systems need to be traceable, it needs to be non-discriminatory, uh, it needs to be sustainably, so environmentally uh, in sustainable, and then the OSI is working on the open source AI definition, um, and if, if it follows anything like the open source definition, that doesn't discriminate against field of endeavor, uh, but that seems to be at odds with each other. So if something needs to be environment, like, you know, sustainable, and also non-discriminatory, but also, mm, like, how are those two going to be reconciled? That'd be that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, um, big fan of the OSI. I am, and uh, I think um, what is going to uh, kind of come out from from a lot of this is that. Uh, what we are likely, what people may be um, unaware of is that the OSI is a very, very small, very, very small organization that really relies on the rest of the community to help with its work. Um, and, and this definition that they're working on for open source AI, um, it's not something that they are just kind of writing in a back room. Um, and then delivering out to everyone because they're the expert. It really is, um, for the last two plus years, going out to speak with different companies slash manufacturers, different projects, different um, experts, um, also different folks in the government and policy to try and actually really tease out what is going to underpin laws like the, the AI law, what is going to underpin uh, products and, and hype that's happening right now, um, and also what is going to hopefully be, just like with the open source definition, something that can be an anchor for then more, let's say, policy regulation or more uh, great kind of um, guidelines, for lack of a better term, around how AI can be responsible and um, worthwhile and sustainable and, and so on. I think uh, that's really something that, uh, it's unfortunate that it takes so long, but it's really, really important that it does so that we get it right because of how the hype train is moving very, very quickly on a lot of this. Um, and so for me, uh, I implore anyone who's interested in that to get involved. You don't have to be 
uh, part of any kind of uh, company or, or, or project yourself if you have an interest and a key eye and maybe even expertise in anything AI based and you want to get involved in helping to craft the definition um, the OSI wants you and, and um, come and talk to me and I will share you the relevant links to get involved. Okay, um, another question is, so how can foundations ensure these uh, cyber resiliency uh, regulations uh, around, so more focused for the open source stewards, um, can be also focused on uh, volunteer software projects and not just corporate dominated ones? So I, I feel like here is more the question on how can we ensure diversity of projects in this sense? Is, is there anything foundations can help? Diversity of, I don't, I don't. Yeah, so um, I, I understand uh, that there are some projects that uh, they are more focused by, like con main contributors are coming from comp for employee contributions from cor corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other projects that they ha will be more like um, independent contributors um, govern, like all the contributors, core contributors might be from that whole. How can we ensure that in the future, everything doesn't get also, uh, get only into those projects that have uh, mainly dominated by employees, uh, corporations, sorry, employees contributing code that comes from corporations? Okay, so that companies won't only go for projects that are backed by other companies yeah and and I think like the have question resources is, yeah, yeah. And, and I think the question is more for like how can foundations help and assist with diversity I mean I don't know if there is any 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 uh, like easy answer to that I, I feel it's really interesting to think about <laughs> An idea. Um, so, uh, I mean, I like in full disclosure, I work uh, as a maintainer on a, on, a, on a project that is hugely corporate backed. It's, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Kubernetes, and um, <laughs> but um, it's something that uh, even in those largely corporate backed projects, by the way, we are desperate for more maintainers and more backing. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's something that even within those communities, the reliance on other small projects that don't have that same backing, that same support, um, widely goes unnoticed because there isn't that same um, lifeline or, or like let's say money-based kind of support when it comes to uh, uh, getting the word out there and sharing it and actually getting adoption happening. Um, so one way that I think the um, foundations can help is having a way to spotlight some of these projects that they don't financially support, let's say, via sandbox or an incubating type of um, system, but maybe there's a way they can um, further highlight some of these projects that are out there trying their, their darndest to kind of get noticed and get and get more adoption or, or maintainers and contributors. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I, like I, I'm old enough that like I still read newsletters, and so that would be interesting to me. But, um, but there might be other ways where that can be something that we can highlight. Maybe at these big uh, foundation-backed conferences, we can have times and, and, um, and tracks for those, those little kinds of projects that want to just come in and say, hey, this is who we are. We're backed by no one, but that could change if you, if you pay attention to us, for example. So I was hesitating a bit to, to go for the question because it's a really difficult one. Um, and, and not just for the question of like, how can we support a small project if there are big, there's a big foundation. Um, so one thing that this new environment creates is essentially like a, a higher bar for for the governance of our projects. It, it says you have, we have certain responsibilities, that they're covered by the responsible legal entity, which is usually a foundation. Um, and that means it's not just as easy as it used to be to start a small open source project. As soon as you are like get, getting to a certain level of use and you become like digital infrastructure, um, you have this, this wave of responsibilities coming to you. Um, and we have to understand that the success of open source is based on a lot of trial and error, release early, release often, um, 20 different projects starting, and one percolating up as the best approach. Um, and there's a danger with this new environment that this like grassroots tr experimental trial and error is suppressed a bit because you can't make the cut to... Um, to fulfill this, the governance responsibilities that you have. And I think this is the call 
to, to the foundations, the larger organizations, to, to keep this in mind to enable such, you know, crazy grassroots trial and error approaches. Um, but it's also a call to the whole community to think about it, um, how, how such an environment in the future can be, how we can maintain it to be, to be lively. Um, because we do see a trend of concentration, um, of focusing on very large, very successful projects uh, for good reasons. Um, but the success that we have is built on many, many small projects competing with each other over technical relevance and brilliancy. And I think, I think OSPOs can help with that too. Um, but speaking from the Cisco OSPO, where we, when we have a small project coming up through the company that they want to go out open source, we have certain requirements that we have um, to try and meet that eventual desire of having good governance and, and being a resilient project. And one of those things is minimum of two maintainers. You're a single maintained project that wants to release from Cisco. That is a hard, hard sell um, because we have seen um, uh, through uh, through many, many different kinds of uh, issues that have happened that a single maintained project either cannot be sustained, can is susceptible to uh, social engineering, um, or is or, or unfortunately they they, they die out. Um, or you even have um, interestingly also this happens. Um, I've seen this in the JavaScript community a little bit where a maintainer, a single maintained project that they don't want to give over the reins to have more contributors either, um, which, uh, which, is, which is an interesting thought in open source. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I think OSPOs can help uh, sow some of those good governance practices when it comes from the manufacturer, uh, manufacturer company front in terms of how open source projects get launched. And we, uh, we have those requirements, not as just like a checklist for people that need to kind of uh, adhere to, but we also describe the why so that there is understanding of why we are asking you to find other people to work with you on this project. It's actually because it's a really good idea and it's not just decisions on you and also it means you're able to do more with more, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to ever kind of give a, a blank checkbox, checkbox that people have to fill out with no reason as to why those kinds of rules and, um, are in place. Um, but yeah, OSPOs are definitely have a, a role there in helping out um, some of those projects kind of uh, reach those uh, governance requirements on the foundation level too. Um, so, uh, someone asked about uh, what happens with uh, SaaS companies uh, and if these regulations uh, will cause any ch changes to, to these companies that are taken but they don't contribute. No, that's your, that's your pet peeve, no? Like you say, they can't just take. That is, that's the whole, that's the whole, that's the whole idea. Yeah, so um, even a large SaaS company is building on, on many open source components. And um, well, if they're making digital products available in the internal market, they will have to support them, so they will have to work with the upstream projects. Um, it will not solve all the problems here. One reason is, if you don't ship digital products in the market, still the same SaaS loophole as before, then you don't have all these obligations. Um, second one is, for most businesses, it makes a lot of sense to work upstream and collaborate with others to basically share research and development costs for the things that they want to consume. Um, some businesses are big enough to not do that and basically maintain their own forks. Um, so the dynamic doesn't change as much as we wish in, in this environment, um, but I think the overall understanding is emerging that working upstream is a better approach. And so I hope that this will gradually change things, but I don't think it's as clear. For everybody who makes a product that is like shipped, meaning like given to a consumer, the responsibility is clear. But if you're a SaaS company, you still don't do that. And so the Cyber Resilience Act is less biting for in this environment. Because you mentioned fork, and sorry, I didn't input it in Slido uh, <laughs> because I'm up here, uh, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take my slot. Um, because you mentioned forks, and I, I have heard this question from from other people is where um, if, if there is open source projects right now that might you know like we feel like might be at risk of changing their license, could they use this new regulation as a sort of like that last sort of push where they say, oh, our hand was kind of forced, we can't, you know, we can't deal with the overhead, so we're changing our license, and that's an easier sell to their use base that they've changed the license? They could say that, but it would be a lie. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> but, it, but it might sound more pleasant, you know. Um, I mean, 
personal statement, right? None of the companies that are to today are saying, oh, business pressure, we have to switch to a business license, would ever have gotten to the point where they are today if their product wasn't open source. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody adopts foundational technology in any sort of software stack that's proprietary at this level. Nobody does it. And, and so it's just a simple bait and switch trick. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if you want to go for that because your investors are pushing you in that direction, there's not much we can do yeah. except fork, yeah. which we recently did a couple of times. And, and I think that's a very clear message at the moment from the open source community to yeah, entities trying to uh, roll us over with such a license switch that we won't really accept this and we are using the right to fork. And um, yeah, so as, as I said, if, if, if that's the argument, oh, we have a lot of responsibility now, so we are going to not be open source, well, so be it. Um, I don't think this is the intention. I don't think this is where the law is pushing you. Um, I think it's probably more that your business situation looks like it, like this, and forces you to do that. Um, another question that I've got comes from the uh, maintainer side. So, with these regulations, uh, I, I think we, we are seeing like more pressure to maintainers. Like, here are the issues that I want you to to fix. Uh, and with with all this pressure, someone was asking like, uh, if there is a vulnerability or a bug that I don't, I don't get the time to fix it, on, like I, I cannot fix it on time. Will there be any, um, like any issues for, for the maintainer uh, in that case? No. <laughs> <laughs> Will Daniel Stanberg be fined if he is not? <laughs> um, the answer is quite clear. Um, the responsibility is with the manufacturers. And, and this is what I tried to explain earlier, is this, this, in, the, this intention to motivate them to actually work with upstream. Um, maintainers still owe you nothing. Like, if they don't have time that weekend to fix a bug, they don't fix the bug. Uh, if you need it fixed, like, I mean, I've been in this situation. Oh, we need to ship the product this Friday. You need to fix this now. I don't work for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so... If you have a need as a manufacturer that something needs to be fixed by this Friday when your sprint ends, then you better assign resources to it and develop the patch. And, and the maintainers don't owe you that work. Or you can maybe negotiate with the maintainers. Maybe you can hire them. I don't know. But um, So the answer to, in, to this is very clearly the maintainer is not responsible for fixing something in time. They're, min, they're probably responsible for diligence to import, to, to in, uh, in integrate change requests that come in that fix the issues. That would be also something we would love to do. Um, but they're not the one, you cannot pin them down and say you need to fix this now. Nope. Uh, and, and I think like um, I, I've i seen this year a really huge shift or uh, OSPOs or subject matter, ex OSPOs or subject matter experts working in organizations becoming more and more friends of the security team so they contribute upstream with uh, not just code, but even like some kind of uh, governance or security checks or tooling that help this project, this upstream project to, to be more secure, to identify the security. So I think like the OSPOs are doing a really good uh, thing uh, for these uh, maintainers, if, if doing good, to, to help them uh, because it's, the organization are realizing, okay, the maintainer is not going to guarantee me something, anything. So let's invest. And I think that is what is the most important thing. Let's invest in open source talent on an organizational level uh, to make sure the software that I rely on and my companies rely on and organizations, not just companies, also public administrations are relying on is secure. Um, any comments on that or, okay, because keep having lots of questions. <laughs> um, okay. So when does an open source project become a product impacted by the regulation? I think we, we briefly touched that um, Okay, and then um, what are the important timelines of these regulations when they become effective and mandatory about time? 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the Cyber Resilience Act has been accepted in March and is now percolating through the uh, publication process and translation process and will then be communicated in, we expect it like in the third quarter this year. And then there's a three-year implementation period until where gradually the responsibilities become effective. So it doesn't happen tomorrow, uh, but keep in mind if you're a large business, three years is not a long time. Um, it's, it's almost over already. Um, and also in that time, um, there are two more things happening. Um, one is there will be a guidance document developed by the European Commission with a lot of like implementation details, and we're very curious what it will say. Um, <laughs> and, and the other one is a, a larger request for standards development going to um, the European Standards Development Organizations where things like what are the requirements to ship a browser um, with no known vulnerabilities? Uh, th things like that will be defined as a standard and this will of course massively affect uh, how you ship products uh, so and this will happen in the three years as well so we have three years but a lot is happening in these three years and as a large business you need to basically get engaged yesterday uh, maybe today um, and and really start making a plan on how you roll out these changes one thing also to note um, and it, this information came out recently is that um, um, unlike the worry that many people had in terms of the wording of the CRA, there will not be a specifically maintained vulnerability database that collects all the CVEs. That's not going to be something that the EU or, um, or um, uh, NISA does. Um, but that was something that there was a lot of worry about that with the wording around the CRA. So that's also very important in terms of for maintainers and for uh, companies and manufacturers too, there isn't going to be a large database that someone can just hack and get all the vulnerability information from. That's not going to be happening. I have a question. I think it's not fully related with regulations, but a lot of people voted, so I'm just going to, uh, sorry. So what will prevent companies from forking open source projects instead of contributing? Like one example that this person, Sarah, is as Amazon did with open search. Well, I mean, Amazon was not the only a company involved in the forking of open search. Um, so as long as it's not, uh, and that is open search is, is open source. So that's a good thing, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like a single vendor, that might be, an, that, that's an issue. Uh, but open search is not single vendor. Um, one way that um, I think uh, OSPOs can help in this, in terms of just uh, not forking and, and actually purposely um, putting resources into the project and contributing upstream, um, is uh, we have been pushing at the, uh, for the Cisco OSPO to be really, really involved in, in helping to push open source general policy throughout the company so that it is easier for our departments internally to adopt open source rather than have, having to create their own work. Um, that's something that is, and by that we mean we want compliance to be easy and frictionless and as much obfuscated as possible so that they can just kind of comply and, 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 and tick the box, yes. Still getting the information about how that works for them and why, but also um, staffing our OSPO so that we can actually push those requests through, through. I don't want a department internally at Cisco waiting on me for months and months to be told whether they can adopt X or Y project or whether they contribute upstream to X or Y project. Um, so a way that we can actually help with this is actually staffing the initiatives that help companies move faster in adopting as well. So And, and we don't often talk about that. That really is the work of OSPOs. We, 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 we're, the, we're the busy people around making open source work in, in certain companies and, and so on. And so we, we want to make sure that it, it's, it's easy and it's um, understood. Um, and I think that's something that instead of, and also actually that the information is there. So if we are speaking to a department where they say we're looking to create, you know, um, uh, a really, really cool event-driven system that's available in real time for uh, this certain kind of project that we have and we want it in Rust. And I'm like, well, there's a project already that exists and here's, you know, information about it. It's called Tremor and et cetera. And so we, we want to actually also stay up to date with being able to give them that information so that adoption can happen too. Um, and, and I think that's one of the ways that OSPOs can help. Um, another way is um, through what you mentioned before, Floor, like actually staffing people who are maintaining the projects that the company has called out as this is a, um, a, a something that we want to focus on and this is a priority for us. And having priorities, that's also important. Companies should have priorities. This is something that in, in open source particularly, um, I think that's not always, that feels like a, it should be a given, but I don't think it is. Um, and we don't talk about that as much. 
requires you to really understand open source well to have priorities, so difficult sometimes. Um, maybe one direct response to the question is, we can never ever prevent anybody from forking because it's one of the basic rights we give everybody. Um, we should create an environment where they don't want to fork. Um, and, and what prevents people from forking? Well, the only thing is that they're responsible for the fork product. Um, so they have to either in develop it all by themselves um, or they have to build a new community around it. And, and we've seen different kinds of fork, like the fork into in-house where you say, I'm going to make my own version. Well, then it's your project. It's not open source anymore, basically. Um, or we have a fork like into community where we're building community around products that previously have been single vendor. And there, one thing I do observe is that um, quickly, contributors jump in are actually contributing features that have been artificially differentiated before, like not released to open source and missing in the product so that you can really use it. And, and if you look at those recently forked projects, you see people, like a community forming very quickly with people saying, this isn't technically really difficult, let's just add this missing feature that the manufacturer didn't want to give us before. Um, and now the community-owned version is actually functionality-wise more advanced than the proprietary one. Um, so, yeah, we can never ever prevent forks from happening. Um, and we don't want to technically. And we don't want to technically, um, but maybe we can create an environment where only good forks happen. <laughs> Uh, there is a new question. Um, so it says, don't you think that this will essentially kill projects run by small companies? I, I understand that this is a company open source a project, right? Uh, and force them to contribute under umbrellas, like foundations umbrellas. Like, I, I, I also questioning, like, is that a, a good thing or a bad thing? Like, it's, I, th I think the question is more about, is is now going to be like all open source projects to be within foundations to to be to meet like some sort of framework or so on and then is that a good a good thing a bad thing i don't i don't think all projects need to be in foundations to to meet this framework absolutely not we i mean but at the same time um, I think what the question is asking is, is that going to kind of stifle yeah, I think possibly the, the new the projects? The question is like, with these regulations, is it going to incentivize more projects to say, okay, let's, we need to put it un, under our foundation? Cannot be seen as an in, independent. I think it's, that is the question. I, I think this is one of the issues where like, the, the answer is not very short. Like, um, if you're a manufacturer, you make gadgets, and, and you develop an open source project that you, you, you need for these gadgets. Um, you're not going to have more responsibilities because you're shipping these products and you're responsible for them anyway. Um, they have to be safe to use, they have to be uh, certified for the necessary use cases, and in the future you also have to maintain the software and fixed vulnerabilities. That's the only difference. And if you happen to develop an open source project on the site, this doesn't add to your responsibilities, you have them anyway. Um, yes, if you just look at the open source project, you have the responsibilities of a maintainer, but since you're shipping products, you have those anyway. That's the complicated answer here. Um, for, there's a, sp a special case for like single vendor projects. Um, and this has long been slightly controversial, where you say, well, it's open source, but it's not an open development model, it's not openly governed. Um, is this really what we want? It works for some companies. Um, but, but often there's a certain conflict between the community that uses and, and wants to contribute to the product and the company that wants to own it. Um, and this is going to become more difficult in the future because all these organizations are going to be manufacturers. They can't pose as open source communities, which they're not anyway. Um, and, um, and, and therefore they have to take on these responsibilities. Yes, this will, I think, have impact, an impact on which projects are viable for like a single vendor, single vendor model. Um, but that's maybe a change that was long coming, and maybe it's a good catalyst to sort, sort us out. Uh, and, and there is another straight question, really straightforward question, like what happens is if an open source community just doesn't care about these regulations? Doesn't what? Doesn't care. Like it's like, whatever. I'm just doing my open source project, and I'm, yeah. That, that, I, I think is yeah. It's a very simple answer. Uh, if you're if you're a larger foundation, you can't. Uh, you, you have a legal legal role in the law. You can't ignore it. Uh, I can stop shipping products like open source releases. 
yeah, uh, Apache Foundation will have the exact same issue. Uh, if you're a small, unincorporated open source project and you don't care, that's fine. Then you're not an open source software steward, you're just a hobbyist project. Um, and if you never incorporate, you never found an organization around the project, that's good. What you have to realize is if you want to do that, if you want to register your nonprofit organization to be able to receive donations, then you're a steward, and then you have to take on these very limited responsibilities. So I think this goes back to like, if I'm just an open source contributor, you're good. Right? It's organized foundations, like incorporated foundations, or umbrella organizations, or projects, and manufacturers who need to care. Anna, you're the boss of this uh, stage, but I see some indication that people want to ask questions, but can't use the Slido, maybe, because oh, it's gone? Okay, yeah. Or so maybe do we... Let me go back, but I keep we keep receiving We keep receiving <laughs> enough questions. Yeah, I think we, we cannot cover all of them, so I'm trying to see, like, the most voted ones. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, another question. Are freelancers who use open source projects in their work consider manufacturers? Does this reg the crowd regulation have any impact on clients of those freelancers? A freelancer that is a manufacturer? Yeah, right? no, I think it's not about contributing. It's freelancers who use open source projects in their work if they are considered manufacturers. If you're making something available in the market, yeah. then you are a manufacturer. So if you're a freelancer and you're taking an upstream project and you add your two little favorite features to it and then you bring that to your client, mm. then you're making a new version of it available in the market. Yeah. If you are going to your client and they have the software that they get from upstream and they ask you to make it work, you're not giving them any software, so you're just a service provider. Yeah. Um, so you have to think about your, your work setup um, the, the responsibilities that you have under that, and based on that, the answer is maybe. Um, so this is a situation where you also want to maybe cons consult your lawyer. Yeah, I, I, what's really important here is the definition of work, right? Um, and I think, um, and, and less important is the defini definition of freelancer first. Like, what what is that work? And then that'll actually designate whether you're considered a manufacturer or not under the law. I think what is... Um, uh, we talk. That, that, I've heard that question before in terms of like I'm a freelancer, but there's actually three or four of us, and we we're kind of a company, but not really, and we just kind of all work together, and you know, um, li living in Berlin, thirty percent time, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I I think that definition of work is actually what's really, really important. And I know that that's something also that has been a, a subject of discussion at um, at the policy level too, because that uh, definition at first seemed easy when um, you're a manufacturer like Cisco creating products. That's, a, that's for us easy to define. Um, but definitely um, the, the, this, this question is something that I think we probably need to do a lot more digging into providing information. And I think maybe open source stewards might be able to help with that. <laughs> um, but providing information for that because that is going to be something that that work definition get, will get hazier um, uh, the more that this uh, law kind of uh, accelerates to that three-year period. Um, there's another question uh, that is how contributors easily understand uh, all these uh, responsibilities, especially if knowing if uh, their open source project is an open source steward or not. Apart from this conversation where we are sharing this, I feel like the question is where can they find more information that is easily digestible to, yeah. You've got a lot of foundations who are giving their opinions and information about this. I know the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation have all written information, blog posts, et cetera, to actually help um, describe a lot of this for their, for their users, members, maintainers, and so on. Um, I would say uh, foundations are a great place to start to look for some of that easily digestible information. Um, and, and your foundation of choice too, I, I, the three that I mentioned are definitely, and, and OSI as well has also put information out um, uh, trying to make this as digestible as possible. You don't have to only rely on one foundation for that information. Maybe one tip would also be, uh, we're always talking about this in abstract terms, like, oh, I need to understand what I am. I mean, you're working on a product and you're consuming a, a handful of dependencies. So you can say, where do I get them from? Is this uh, like a, a project hosted at a foundation? Is this a part-time single maintainer who works on this on a Saturday evening? 
um, and, and this is the situation you need to understand. If I contribute to this, what do I, what, what happens? Um, so, so let's, if you make it less abstract and you look specifically at the product you're developing and the, the versions, the software that you consume, it becomes a lot more clear. Um, and if you contribute to a project, if you're a member of a community, a very engaged member, maybe a maintainer of a community that is properly incorporated, then you know that you're working out a steward like you're contributing as a, as a steward. Um, so I think if you look at it at this level, it will become much more clear. Um, I got a licensing question uh, that just came out, but I think it's, it's quite interesting. So should so companies pay contributors when they change to business license, uh, especially for this li um, recently licensed change uh, on Redis and so on. So, uh, and this person said, because contributors feel that their work is no longer actually free like before. So what are your thoughts on, on that? When a company says, okay, let's change the business license, all these open source contributors. And is the question asking, should those contributors, companies. should those companies now pay those contributors because they changed the license? Yeah. I mean, in a perfect world. But yeah, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I think uh, those contributors have a really, really good, uh, can have a really, really good look at it. That's something they can do, which is a fork. <laughs> um, uh, because because the, the bottom line is it's going to be, it could be very difficult to engage in a discussion like this with a company in the first place. If you, the first you're hearing about the license changing is that the license gets changed. So that means that there's not a dialogue happening um, and that, that's not taking place. Um, and so um, I am always one for, for, for trying a lot of that, but should companies pay? I mean, I think that, that there's, a, there's a position that we can all take. Of course, we want, we don't want companies to pay, but do they have to? Unfortunately not. <laughs> Um, and that's and that's what's what's really sucky about those kind of changes. But that's also something that that I would say personally that I hope these regulations coming in actually have companies really reconsider those kinds of possible those kinds of possible changes in terms of the cost as well, rather than the possible gain that a license change brings to them. So I, may, I may be misunderstanding the question, but if the question is. Uh, if I'm a contributor and this project is now commercial, I love to contribute to open source projects. I love to do this for free. If it's interesting, fine. If you want me to contribute to a commercial project that's called work and you better pay me for it. Yeah. So um, I would not contribute to a project that is not on an open source license. Yeah, and, and I think I, 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 the, the community has the power there. And I think there's been other examples on how the community, once this has happened, has said, no, let's fork and let's contribute on, on another brand or another fork. So I think like you as a contributor uh, and the community behind, you have the power to, to decide. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, I think we're gonna start wrapping up. I know there are so many great questions that we cannot cover. Um, I, I would like to start with all the, uh, so the, all, uh, uh, um, event uh, organizers here, because I think it's really interesting. Uh, but to wrap up, and in just maybe 30 minutes, one minute, what are your final remarks? Uh, I, I, I let you some time, <laughs> give you some time to think about. <laughs> and I, I think it's a lot to process. There has been so many different topics and, and themes. Anna, maybe you can start us off, actually. No, haven't no, haven't have you been looking at the open source AI definition quite a bit? And so maybe there is a, a closing thought from, from uh, you there. So, okay, yeah. So about the, uh, the AI, the, uh, on the AI Act, I think like uh, the community and, and people still working on it. Uh, you mentioned about the open source AI initiative that it's in a working group on the AI definition. I think it's really interesting the, the angle they're taking, right? Because there are putting into uh, different um, modules on what happens with the data sets, what's the level of openness of the data sets, or the training models, or, or the software itself, right? Uh, and they're trying to, there, there are two angles, they're trying to have it like, it's yes or no, or there are other angles that is more like a, a 
gradient, like from from like it's it's not black or white, but it's a scale of grays. So I think still we're still figuring out uh, how how is it. But uh, I think there have still there are now like a beta version where people can contribute on on the definition. And uh, this working group is meeting. I think it's weekly or every two weeks or so. Every two weeks. Um, but I think once there is like a final definition, at least a version 1.0, uh, it's gonna it's gonna be really it's gonna impact a lot organizations. Uh, right now, I, I know like some organizations when they comes to the AI Act, they're waiting and waiting. Uh, and it's like okay, let's let's see um, what what the community and what the industry and what the organizations are, are doing. So I think this movement will make a great impact. Okay, so sorry, I needed a bit of time to think about this. Um, I think for the last, I don't know how, how many decades, we've asked policymakers to take open source seriously. Um, now they do. Um, they even, they even, they, they, they write the words free and open source software, literally, in the law. So that means something. Um, so we should be, I think, grateful about this sign of success of all our work. Um, and, and we should not be too scared of this. Um, it's meant to help us. And I think the, the job that the Apache Foundation and the Linux Foundation have in front of us is uh, to, to manage this change and to maybe support those parts of the community that are not directly supported by this law um, and to build up this new environment. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I, for one, am very, very grateful for all of the questions that were asked. Whoops. Very grateful for the... Oh. <laughs> it's me, the problem is me. Yeah. <laughs> My time is up. It's up. <laughs> <laughs> Is this working? No. Raz, dva, raz, dva. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Maybe they can use this. Time's up. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe you can walk close to them. There you go. <laughs> I won't be getting that close. Okay. Uh, grateful for all the questions that are asked because both we have three days here, so we can have a lot of you know you know food for for discussions. That's a good thing, um, and also it helps me better understand what questions we might have internally at our company uh, and figure out a way to answer all of those questions. Uh, be, so you know, like make sure that there is clear guidance also internally. Yeah, and for me, um, I'm, I'm sitting here representing the Cisco OSPO, but I'm also a maintainer and a contributor to open source. And for me, uh, this law, just like Mirko also said like a few times, there's a lot of like simple things that I can gather from this law, which is that the EU, in terms of government, now cares about open source in a very, very official way, which is great, um, but that it doesn't impact my work in terms of my, me contributing upstream at all in the sense that, if anything, um, I should be doing more of it. Um, well, you know, as, as much as I can. And then I want to actually help uh, um, and push other people around me to also join me in contributing upstream more. Um, at, the, at my company, um, in, my, in my community uh, that I'm currently in around the cloud native side, that we want to be contributing a lot more. And, and also contributing in a way that is going to be robust and secure as well. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.